All right, you doing okay? Yeah, you're a really lively bunch this morning. So we're going to start out with interactive, okay? So we are in the the last week of our series titled Project Gratitude. And what we've been doing is trying to kind of re-examine our hearts and understand the way that God would have us as Christians to live in this world. So we live in a world where there's a lot of voices of discouragement. Sometimes they're on the outside. Sometimes they're inside our own minds. We live in a world where our news cycle makes us feel like everything is just going to Hades in a handbasket quite literally, right? We live in a world that constantly wants us to want things so that we spend our money and we buy things. And this can drive us to be people who are pessimistic about the world, people who don't appreciate what they have and only want more and more and more, and people who believe that the voices of discouragement are the truth, and we miss the voice of God outside and inside of us. And so we wanted to examine what it means to live life the way that God would have us to so that we could have an attitude and a heart of gratitude, not just because it's Thanksgiving. This is an excellent time of year to highlight this because this is the way that God would have us to live all of the time. And so our very first week, we talked about that we are optimistic. The sermon title was just simply titled, I'm optimistic. In a world that tells us that things are getting worse and worse, God says, I am active in the world and I am a force that is moving this world towards resolution, towards reconciliation and towards redemption. And I'm inviting you to be a part of that. And so the principle we walked away from that you'll see on the screen today in our first week was that I'm not optimistic based on what I see, and I'm especially not optimistic based on how I feel, but I am optimistic based on what God says and on who God is. I'm not optimistic based on what I see or what I feel. I'm optimistic based on what God says and who God is. And then we moved into our second week and we talked about that we are grateful. And in a world, especially this time of year, I don't know if you've noticed it, but the commercials have started ramping up, right? We're getting ready for Black Friday sales. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but do some of you already have your Black Friday plan worked out? Like you know where you're going, right? You're excited to see what the deals are on Black Friday, but you don't know if you're going to buy it because it may be on Amazon cheaper on Cyber Monday, right? We've got this plan because we want want things. And it's not bad to use our resources wisely and to have some things in our life. I'm not here to to pick on you if you're going. Have fun going Black Friday shopping, doing whatever it is that you're going to do and have a great time, right? But this world is a world that is constantly telling us that what we have and who we are is not good enough and that we should want more, be more, so that we can spend money to become those things, right? The number one section at the bookstore is what section? Self-help, right? 100% the truth. Self-help every time. And then we're marketed cell phones and everything else in this time of year. And so what we came away with is that as Christians, we find that Scripture talks to us about contentment, about being grateful for what we have. And so the principle we walked away with on the next slide is that we will not let what we want rob us of what we have. We will not let what we want rob us of what we have. And this came out of Ecclesiastes 16. This is not Ecclesiastes 6, 10, 6, 9, but this is the principle we pulled from it. I will not let what I want rob me of what I have. And then the third week, last week, we talked about that we will be encouraging, that we will be a people of encouragement, that this world is full of negative voices and voices of discouragement. Our own voice, when we look in the mirror, tells us one thing, Right? When we go out into the world, we constantly project onto others their negative opinions of us when we go out. And the world constantly tells us that we should be more. And we compare ourselves in our, our Facebook posts and our Instagram posts to the, to the beautiful people of the world. And we begin to feel like we're not measuring up. But God calls us to be an encouraging people. We will be a people that encourage others. And so today, we're going to talk about our next topic, But I'm actually going to invite you, we're going to start in 2 Corinthians today. If you've noticed, we've been in 2 Corinthians a couple of times throughout this. So if you want to flip along with me, I'll also have it up on the screen. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 11. We read this a little bit earlier, but remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. 
And when I read this, I kind of thought, duh, right? Like if I only plant 10 seeds, I'm probably only going to have nine sprout up. But if I plant 100, I'm probably going to get 90 sprout up, right? And so I was trying to understand how does this apply to us? Because as we begin to walk throughout these scriptures, we hear about God talking about how we are a people who live generously as Christians with our time, with our resources, with whatever it is. And I was trying to understand how this applies and, and I came to this principle. I remember this saying that I heard when I was growing up, and, uh, and I'm not sure why it always stuck with me, but we've got a slide with it on it. And it just simply says, society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they will never sit in. Have you heard that before? Society grows great when old men plant trees. Sorry for the word old. We, uh, Ms. Janice would say more mature men plant trees whose shade they know they will never sit in. Now, this is the exact opposite of our financial markets, right? Like we've got to hit our marks every quarter and we're not going to invest in something that doesn't benefit us. So this is different than the way that we understand our world. This is saying we invest in something greater than us that will outlive us, that will be bigger than just us and we do it together, right? So as I was reading this, this just came to mind, I don't know. I had this moment where I now, I think I'm starting to qualify for that uh, more mature part. I was at a, a funeral service on Thursday, <clears throat> and um, we were sitting, we were standing around talking after the graveside with one of the young ladies of the church, and I and, um, went to support her, and somebody's alarm was going off on their phone. Y'all ever been there? Y'all ever did that? Alarm just starts going off, and it was one of those really loud, super annoying alarms, like don't forget to take your heart medicine alarms. You know what I mean? And, and it was just going off, going off, going off. It's like 2.30 in the afternoon. And then um, she leans over and she says, Stephen, I think that's you. <laughs> and I was like, no way. And I pulled my phone out, sure enough. <clears throat> and she leaned in and she said, I'm glad I could be here the exact moment that you became an old man. <laughs> it's like, I can't even argue. You're 100% right. I put it on my calendar. Today was the day. That's right. <clears throat> but here, here's the truth of the matter that, that we as Christians take away from this. Because this Greek proverb is great. But here's how I would rephrase it for us that we're going to find in 2 Corinthians 9 today. Generosity is planting seeds for an eternal harvest. Generosity is planting seeds for an eternal harvest for you and for others. You see, we say each and every week when we take up our offering as an example of that, that we want these gifts to go towards building the kingdom of God on this world. Well, I plan on the kingdom of God outliving me. I plan on the kingdom of God being bigger than me. I plan on the kingdom of God having an eternal consequence that is so much larger than I am that I would not even be able to imagine how God can multiply those gifts of time, of resources, of energy, of love and care for creation and love and care for our fellow people, for our love of God. God is going to take and multiply those in a way that we can't understand. When I was serving in a, in a church not far from here and many of the people in, the, in there were farmers and we would meet at the co-op some mornings and we would begin to see what, the, what was happening. And I was amazed that, that farmers seem to have no doubt that there is a God because there's something that's miraculous that happens in their life. They take a little brown thing that's barely bigger than a few grains of sand. They poke a hole in the earth and they put it down in there and then they go to sleep. And when they wake up in the morning, it feeds their family. It feeds their livestock. It takes care of their entire life. While they sleep, God does something miraculous and takes something that seems like dirt and death and turns it into life, right? We are planting seeds for an eternal harvest. We're going to look and we're going to walk through verses 7 through 11 together. So if you have your Bibles, you're welcome to read along, but it will be on the screens. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Now here we see in 2 Corinthians that Paul is now taking this look at being a farmer, planting a crop, having an eternal harvest, and he's applying it towards this idea of giving. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. Now, here's one of the major faults that people put against the church. They say that the church is all about money. And we see in this scripture, when you're doing it wrong, absolutely. But when we're doing it right, what we are doing is calling people to a faithfulness that God has called. We read here in scripture, each person decides how much they will give, not because of pressure, right? 
It's not out of guilt. It's not out of making you feel bad or wanting more as a church. It's about saying, how are we faithful to who God has called us to be? You see, we would say, we would invite you into next steps for your prayer life. We would invite you into next steps for your discipleship and your education as a Christian. We would invite you into next steps and missional opportunities to take on. But sometimes when it comes to talking about the financial resources of the church, we shy away from it. Because we live in a culture where we think that it's just simply about the money. And it is not. It is about faithfulness. And see, God doesn't want something from you. God wants something for you. God wants us to be a people of generosity who reap an eternal harvest. <clears throat> this other, this word, reluctantly, I, I want to spend just a moment with that. I, um, I remember when Nikki and I were first getting married and we talked about giving to the church, and I've joked before, but that's back when we used to just sit around with two pennies and rub them together hoping they'd multiply. <laughs> you know that time in life, most likely, right? And then when we were writing a check for, I, I doubt it even crossed $100 that first time, right? It wasn't that big a deal. And I remember talking to somebody who said, well, but I make a whole lot more than that. And that check is a whole lot bigger. I believe it was Rockefeller who said that he wouldn't have been able to tithe his first million if he had never tithed his first penny. And so there's this moment of reluctancy. And you know how I got over that moment of reluctancy? I tricked myself. I made my bank automate it. Because I'm going to be honest with you, I was a reluctant giver. I would run through in my mind all the things in my budget that that money could have gone for, all the things that we wanted to do, all the things that we had hopes to do, are our, our, my fear of the future and what that might hold. And it made me reluctant. And at first, I had to trick myself into giving. But then we get to the second step of the scripture, and it says, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And I believe you have experienced that in your life. When you take something down from the angel tree and you turn it in and you know that it is going to bring joy to someone's life, you feel alive inside because you know that you're participating in something good, that your generosity is changing a life. We just sent, what was it, 47 bajillion shoeboxes around the world? Wasn't that the final number? 1,800 and something shoeboxes around the world. And did, did, were you reluctant when you were packing those shoeboxes? No. You were full of joy and cheer, and it was beautiful. Even though Amy was hurting us like an assembly line around, right? She's doing such a great job. But we were joyful because we knew that we were acting like God in this world. Verse 8, And God will generously provide all that you need, then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. And God will give generously, provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Now here, I believe, is one of the hardest conversations to have with yourself, as well as one of the hardest conversations to have with your spouse or whoever it is that you may be financially accountable to. What is the difference between need and want? Can anybody give me a good definition? What's the difference between need and want? I see all the spouses purposely not making eye contact. (laughs) Like, oh my God, she's looking right at me, right? Perhaps we drove here this morning in it, right? Yeah, what is the difference between need and want? Because you see, in this scripture here, out of the NLT version, it says, God will generously provide all you need. Then you will have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. You see, sometimes we have to ask ourselves a difficult question, a question that we don't like. What is the difference between what we need and what we want? And have we sometimes shifted that word need over to the category of want so that we can get what we want? I know I've done that. I'll say things like, I need a new car. Picking on cars this morning, right? We need a new house. We need to go on vacation. Whatever it is, I don't know. Those are all great things. I hope you get to do those things. But what is the difference between need and want? 
Verse 9, as the scripture says, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. And this is an absolute, this quote comes from Psalms 112. And I'm not going to share it with you this morning for time, but if you were looking for a scripture to read this week about the characteristics of godly people and you're getting ready for Thanksgiving, Psalm 112 is a wonderful one to reference right here out of this verse. But it says, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Verse 10, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. I want to go back to the first part of verse 10. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. And this is where I struggle with this as well. You see, providing the seed for me, I don't know about that. I'm pretty sure I worked hard and I bought those seeds, right? Was I provided those seeds? You see, when I plant them in the ground, I can get on board with the fact that God made them grow. But I worked hard and I bought those seeds and I put them in the ground. And then I did everything I could to make sure that things went right. I, I watered and I fertilized the soil and I tilled it or I didn't till it or whatever the, tra- the trend is at the time. I made sure that I came back and I used pesticides and I, I did everything that I could do to make sure that that seed came up. And then God provided the bread. Well, I don't know about that. I took that seed. And I husted and I cracked it and I made wheat with it and I got the yeast and I kneaded it together with the water and the oil and I I put it in the oven and I cooked it and then I pulled it out and I sliced it at just the right time. You ever pulled it out too early, right? And then I did it at just the right time and then I I had this bread and I, I made the bread. Did God provide that bread? The answer is yes. You see, we as a society, we believe that it is all ours that we earned it, that we get to decide everything that we do with it. And you're like, man, I'm glad we came for another give us your money Sunday, right? (laughs) But see, that is not the point. We are trying to live as faithful Christians in a world that is telling us that what we have is not enough, but it's also telling us that everything we have is ours because we bootstrapped it ourselves and that that's the American way. But God says the eternal kingdom of God has something different to say about the resources of this world. That I have given it to you, no matter how hard you work to buy it. That I have given it to you, no matter what you've done afterwards to increase it and turn it into the thing that I want you to turn it into. And that I will continue to bless it for generations to come. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Verse 11, yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. You see, at the end result of this generosity is that people will thank God. That through the generosity of a church like ours, that people will know God, who God is. And you see, we are a generous church. I want you to hear that this morning. Through our budget, we support dozens of ministries here in this community, not just the ministries of our church. We're talking about places like Urban Ministries and Loaves and Fishes and Manic Cafe and Operation Christmas Child and and Safe, Soldiers and Families Embraced and, and Room in the Inn and Habitat for Humanity and all kinds of other places that we want to make sure that those places have the resources they need to continue building God's kingdom here on earth. We are a generous church. Instead of taking up some of the denominationally mandated giving Sundays each time we have Holy Communion, what do we do when we have Holy Communion? We have the Good Neighbor Fund. The monies that are left down here on the rails each and every Sundays, they're not tipping the pastor. Those go straight, 100%. No administration taken out. 100% of those on the next Tuesday, that following Tuesday, 100% of those funds go out to people in our community who can't pay their utility bills. And if you've been here on a Tuesday morning, you've seen them, they line up early so they, they can get here. And many of you participate in giving out those ministries, interviewing people, listening to their stories. What they want more than getting their $40 for their water bill is someone who cares, who generously gives of their time, who generously lends a listening ear. We're generous even to our guests. 
We give $5 away to charity for every new person that comes to our church. You've probably heard us say that each week, but unless you've come recently, you may not even realize that. They get a follow-up email if they write their email on the blue sheet, and we ask them out of a list of several ministries in the area outside the church, where would they like for us to make a $5 donation in their name? And if they email us back and they tell us one, we send it off. And otherwise, we send money on anyway but they get to participate and be generous just by visiting our church. This past Wednesday, I hope you got to be here for our first responder appreciation night, but it was awesome. That is a church that is generous and full of gratitude. A church that thanks the first responders in our area for being the people who answer our calls when we fall into emergency and crisis. We had the men's club donated over 50 turkeys Robert Perigo and several of you got together and were able to to smoke those turkeys on Tuesday and give them out. We fed, I don't know, a couple dozen people who actually came to the event or more that were first responders, but we fed hundreds more at the fire stations, at the EMS stations, at the jail, at the E911 dispatch, probably more places that I forgot so somebody can just correct me later, right? That is a generous church. We support SAFE, the soldiers and family in Bray, so that those who are active as well as retired from the military can get the mental health services that they need for them as well as their families outside of the VA because they found that kind of a lack of transparency and and confidentiality made people hesitant to go and get those resources. And now soldiers and families embrace that we support through tithe dollars here at this church has now opened up those services to first responders. And so they came to be a part. That was one of them talking earlier, the executive director of SAFE who was there to say to our community of first responders, here's a resource that is free for you to use and available because there are churches like this that are member supported churches. How are we able to be so generous? Because of the gifts that we receive and take up each and every Sunday and during the week, we are the kingdom of God changing this world for the better in so many ways. We are a member-supported church. There's no magical denominational dollars that trickle down, right? This is us being the kingdom of God together. And so here is my challenge today. We're just going to call it a 90-day giving challenge. Many of you are supporting through Brighter Still on the Hill Many of you are supporting through just regular tithes and offerings, but if you are not someone who gives to the church, I want to invite you to do so in December and January and February to support your church to help make up our shortfall through the end of the year, but also to start us out in the new year. But it's not because we want that from you. It's because we want something for you. We want God to continue blessing so generously the lives that we share together. We want God to know that we are faithful, that we are a people who won't shy away from some of the difficult topics in the church, but we are a people who will call each other to faithfulness. And we will be a people who are found faithful. You see, I want you to have a life of joy, a life of generosity, a life that doesn't hang on the things that we want and that money doesn't grip us in such a way that we cannot overcome it. I want us to be a generous church and I see it each and every day. And those of you gathered in this room, some of you stay overnight at safe place and at the safe house, volunteer with Room in the Inn or the Red Cross or go and pray with our people who are at the hospital and others who are at the hospital. We volunteer our hours and our time with our children's ministry and and schools reading to children, not just in the summer, but throughout the rest of the year. We're starting a partnership of book buddies with more elementary right down the street. We are a generous church and we want to continue living this mission here on the Hill. Let us pray together this morning. God, we are grateful for who you call us to be. We are grateful that you have given us so much. And we are grateful that you have given us such wonderful lay and staff that oversee the resources that you have given. Lord, we ask that you continue to give us generous hearts, that you make us a people that see the work of the kingdom here on this world and a church that continues to live it out. In your son's name we pray, amen.